Welcome everyone. Um, this is the fourth edition of our Energy and Environment webinar series. And today we have the uh, pleasure of having Professor Adri Van Duin. Um, he's the inventor and the main developer of the REACT FF reactive force field method. Uh, he has published over 450 um, journal papers from which over 400 are uh, related to this topic that he's going to be talking about today. And he has distributed also uh, the REACT FF code uh, to over 2,500 universities and industrial research groups. Um, he holds a professorship for several um, fields, such as engineering, science, and mechanics, a professor in chemistry, and also professor in material science and engineering, all of this in Penn State. Earlier this year, he got uh, promoted to distinguished university professor. Um, so we really appreciate you giving us uh, the time to give this webinar. Uh, he's going to be talking about the atomistic scale simulations of realistic uh, reactive materials. And remember that if you have any questions uh, throughout the presentation, who will be, which will be taking around 40 minutes, you can post those questions through the Q&A box that is on the, on the bottom part of your screen. And we will be asking them to Professor Adri at the end of the presentation. So with uh, no further delay, Adri, if you would like to share your screen and the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your kind introduction. Let me go share my screen. Okay, is my screen showing up on your side? Yes, we can see Great. it fine. Great. Thanks again for the introduction and thank you for uh, giving me the opportunity to present my work here. Um, so we're going to talk about, as, as mentioned, the reactive reactive force field method and how it essentially bridges the scale between uh, up initial phase tools and essentially experiments, allowing us to simulate materials as they really are. Typically materials are indeed pretty nasty and complex, uh, especially interfaces. And so ReactiveF provides a tool to investigate these at an atomistic scale level. And so here below on the left, there are some examples. These are still relatively small examples of the type of simulations that we're pursuing with this method. Um, so this is my current research group. Uh, all our projects are kind of uh, atomistic scale uh, based, but we have we, we, we uh, try to um, <clears throat> uh, use them on a fairly large series of, mater uh, of materials. So going from carbon materials, which I'll talk about a little bit, uh, service catalysis, we do a fair amount of work on battery interfaces, especially 2D materials is, is, a, is, is, is a material that is a topic that has been up and coming in my group quite extensively. Um, and also, my let's be my PhD students. Uh, while um, I'm formerly in the mechanical engineering department, <clears throat> I also have uh, PhD students from chemical engineering, chemistry, electrical engineering, and and, and um, engineering science and mechanics. So we really cover a fairly broad top, uh, array of topics there. <clears throat> Another uh, role that I play at Penn State is I'm the director of the Material Computation Center, which is one of the four labs within the Material Research Institute at Penn State. And it, it, this institute really provides a sort of a cross cut between departments. And so it facilitates interdepartmental hire and it, it provides material research facilities for the entire university. What we're trying to do there is put material simulation as sort of the front end of of, uh, of these simulations is an experimentalist finds a new uh, material or finds a new process and then they go towards the computational campus and try to uh, explain why a particular process works and that's clearly useful but arguably you, uh, it would be even better if you actually turn that uh, concept around that you actually do your simulations before you start your experiments because at the simulation level it's relatively easy and relatively inexpensive to uh, look for your material space and test very much out of the box concepts things that are very expensive to study experimentally you can test them with simulation and see if they're uh, if they're worth pursuing and if so you can essentially make the experimental investment to go in that direction <clears throat> 
Um, and while simulation tools are probably not quite good enough to find your very best material or molecule, they are certainly good enough to significantly shrink down our material space and guide it in, uh, in, a, in a direction that can focus experiments. So within material computation, the MCC is essentially a faculty collaboratory. So there's a, uh, a, about 20 faculty affiliated with material computation center. And this allows us essentially to respond to proposals where we need multi-scale simulation. So we have faculty active at various uh, the, uh, size and time ranges in material space, going from quantum mechanics to reactive force fields. My, my group and Susan Sinner's group are active in that area. And then we have non-reactive force fields where we go to about you know, 10 to 100 million atoms. Then we can leave the, for, the atomistic realm and go to more coarser grained tools like phase field, Calfet, and, uh, and then eventually computation fluid dynamics. And quite often you need all these methods or at least a significant subset of these methods in a particular project. So being able to communicate between these various groups is, uh, is, is very important. Important. We also now recently hired a senior, senior technical staff helping us with machine learning um, uh, tools that, that, that help us uh, bridge between these uh, areas. Another role that I play is I, uh, so ReactiveF has been around for about 20 years and it's been incorporated in many uh, popular uh, software environments in the open source domain, there's LAMPS, in uh, the commercial code, ADF, uh, as the uh, produced by SEM Amsterdam is a, is a leading uh, software uh, featuring ReactiveF. And so this software environment has sparked an interest in new ReactiveF parameters. And that interest has been difficult to cater for within my research group because it, uh, uh, because of the length that it takes a student to, to learn this force field development uh, uh, concept. And uh, so we, in, uh, six years ago, founded a company that helps academia and industry with force field development projects. For industry, this is important because they typically want to have force field parameters that are not going in open literature, but also academic clients that have funding uh, that, that need help on the force field development, but know how to do molecular dynamics. We've been, hel we, we've been helping with these groups. Um, so this comes back to the slide that I showed before. So we are talking about uh, ReactiveF is, is geared towards simulating chemical reactions at uh, molecular and material interfaces. And just to see what particular simulation tools are available there. So we start at quantum mechanics on the bottom left here. So these are, tip, these are initial based wave function methods. Uh, very common is density functional theory there. So uh, very transferable and also uh, quite accurate. Uh, but uh, it is mathematically quite complex and as such can only be uh, applied to relatively small systems. And the, uh, the system sizes are increasing as time goes. We have better computation facilities. We have better algorithms. But practically uh, DFT uh, going beyond 500 atoms and going beyond a couple of picoseconds of time is still very, very challenging. So that's pretty much where the empirical force fields come in. They, uh, they can be trained using up initial uh, data or can be trained from experimental data. And they can essentially take your simulation space to a million atoms and beyond. And time-wise going to nanoseconds and sometimes going towards millisecond scales. So if you want to do chemistry, then, uh, can, uh, then you have a couple of options. You can stay within up initio. And so uh, up initio based MD is getting more and more traction these days because we're beginning to get the computation facilities to uh, to, to, to do that, uh, but we still, it, it is very, very time consuming and require immense computational resources. And even with those resources, it's very hard to go beyond sort of the 10, 20 picosecond level. Now you can start to make quantum mechanics faster. So you can use semi critical methods and a very popular method in that domain these days is tight binding DFT. And that indeed allows you to significantly scale up from, uh, from, from DFT and indeed to significant uh, time the uh, options to stay within force field domain and essentially try to make the force field more sophisticated and essentially make force fields which have traditionally been made for non-reactive systems, try to see if we can get some level of reactivity in there. And that field really was started in the late 80s and early 90s by Tursov and Brenner, who developed the Tursov silicon uh, force field and the Brenner carbon force field, which are still uh, quite commonly used. And these are in the field quite often called the sort of the first generation reactive force fields. And so over time, these force fields have been made more 
more sophisticated. And so the common uh, uh, second generation reactor force fields are the COM method from the Synod group, MEM force fields from Baskets and co-workers, and then the reactive F method that, 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 that I've been involved in. And so um, you can also plot this in a different things uh, concept. So within, uh, and this is not a real fair comparison, but it bears, it has at least some sort of connectivity. So in quantum mechanics, we have a sort of a payoff between rigor and computational expense. We want to solve the third, uh, we want to get an exact solution of the certain equation. We cannot get there, but with various approximations, we can get pretty close. In the force field domain, we have essentially our first generation force fields that typically ignore things like uh, non-bonded interactions like Van der Waals or Glom interactions. And the second generation, uh, uh, extends increases accuracy, but also increases computational expense. So uh, COM, Reactive, and QRI Rebo are typically a factor 50 to 100 slower than Rebo and Tursov. And that's also means that indeed Rebo and Tursov still have a significant user base because of their computational speed. So Reactive F borrows some concepts from the first generation reactive force field, especially the Brenner potential, in that it uses a bond order concept. And the bond order concept connects well with chemical intuition. We know about, for example, in the carbon case, we know about single, double, and triple bonds. We know that a triple bond is shorter than a double bond, it's shorter than a single bond. So then we assume, and once again, this is an empirical assumption, uh, so this, uh, we have to fit parameters to make this work, that there's essentially a continuous relationship between bond distance and bond order. And so this is the graph that shows this continuous relationship. Uh, so we update these bond orders every iteration that costs some time because we have to reestablish our connectivity. And then we still would like to use free and four body terms. So we make all those terms bond order dependent. So if the bond breaks, all these free and four body terms go with it. And then in Reactive F, we have a full array of non-bonded interactions from the Waals and Coulomb interaction available. Now, somewhat counterintuitively, these non-bonded interactions are calculated between every atom pair, regardless of whether they are bonded or not. Now, that actually turned out to be a very uh, uh, useful decision, um, especially the Coulomb interaction, because that allows Reactive F to transition between ionic materials, where all the stability is really coming from a Coulomb interaction on a bond, to covalent materials where essentially the bond order drives all the, uh, the bond strength and everything that goes in between. So Reactive F can decide whether a material is ionic or covalent and, and anything in between. And that gives you a significant amount of transferability. So here on the top right, this is uh, more or less the flow of Reactive F. We see that the non-bonded part and the bonded part is completely separate. And I'll come back to that in the end of my presentation. It, this has, uh, this uh, comes up with some limit limitations in reactive ac accuracy when we, for example, have redox reactions. Um, but we see here, indeed, we calculate the bond orders. We then find angles and torsions, and then we can, uh, can progress that into, uh, into a force. And these forces can be used to typically drive a molecular dynamic simulation. So why do we do this? Well, Reactive F is not more accurate than DFT. We can approach DFT accuracy reasonably well as uh, in, uh, for, uh, but the uh, main thing is it is significantly faster. So we get about a, ten to power, a power factor of 10 to the power six speed up, and it also scales better than DFT methods. And so we can apply these methods to relatively large systems. So just to highlight once again, this bond order bond distance relationship. One thing I want to notice is, and that's a big difference between the first generation uh, reactive force fields and the second generation for uh, re uh, and, and reactive F in particular, is that the bond order decay is very slow in reactive F. At two angstrom, this is for the carbon carbon case, we still have half of the bond order left. In the Brenner potential, the bond order goes to zero at about 1.8 angstrom. And that is because they don't want to deal with the, with the next neighbor. If you look in diamond, for example, the carbon-carbon uh, the, the bond, the diamond is 1.5 angstrom, but the next carbon atom is already at about two angstrom. And so in the Brenner potential, they don't want to have to worry with that next neighbor, so they cut off all the bond order 1.8 angstrom. The big disadvantage is it's very difficult if you, uh, uh, if you cut off your bond order so early. And so in reactive we have a much slower decaying bond order, so that we actually can get transition states in the right area. Um, so 
to, we ha also have implicit electron uh, terms, so we don't have explicit electrons in reactive F. I'll get back to that later in my presentation. But we have implicit terms, for example, one that deal with these out of over coordination uh, concepts. So uh, reactive F is aware that carbon has four valence electrons. So if it tries to make bond orders that go beyond four, then we penalize it for that. It uh, doesn't mean that we don't that we disallow that fifth bond. It gets penalized. If it's very silicon, for example, then this fifth bond would be far more relevant. So we can kind of scale this over coordination term depending on uh, on on the on the elemental type. We have a charge calculation concept. So reactive have calculates charges using the EEM or QEQ method. Very, uh, they're kind of uh, same method, which indicate which uh, connect. Uh, atom uh, electronegativity and hardness to a ch to charge distribution. This is quite a powerful tool, and we can indeed reproduce uh, quantum-based charge distributions pretty well. We typically train against Mulliken charges. We can also train against Hirschfeld charges uh, th these days. Bottom line is we can actually reproduce these things. And remember that Reactive F has a on-bond Coulomb interaction, so this really affects the chemistry. This carbon here, the negatively charged carbon, is going to have very different chemistry than the positively charged carbon. Because the Coulomb interaction is actually part of its bond strength. Uh, EM comes with significant disadvantages. It works well around equilibrium, but it doesn't well, uh, work well when you dissociate bond. It actually re uh, retains some charge on that. And it is the most expensive star, uh, part of the reactive force field. And we need to update the charges every MD step to retain uh, energy conservation. So one of the big advantages of reactive F over pretty much any other reactive force field methods is its ability to get transition states right, uh, to get the energies and also to some extent the structures of these things. And here on the top is an example. Uh, it's, it's especially good for concerted reactions where we conserve bond order across a reaction. So here on the top, this is arguably one of the most important reactions known to mankind because this is the type of reactions that enzymes use to, uh, to lower reaction barriers and allows to synthesize and break apart peptides and other type of, uh, of biopolymers. So we have here four water molecules on the left and four water molecules on the right. And we have a sort of a, a, a symmetric transition state. And amazingly, so each OH bond is worth 125 kcal, almost 5 EV. Uh, so we break four of these things. So the total bond strength that we break is almost 500 kcal. And we see we do this with a bear of only 20 kcal. So this is actually a room temperature reaction. It's relatively fast. Uh, and that is because if you have a four water molecule case, we can make this very nice transition state where the bond orders is conserved. So we have all those, all those OH bond orders are, uh, have bond order half. And so the total bond order is the same in the transition state as it is in the reactant or the product. And so this is pretty much the game that enzymes play, uh, many enzymes at least. They tease water molecules in the right configuration. And then if they're in the right configuration, all uh, they can do a concerted reaction and break chemical bonds at a much, much lower barrier. And see that reactive F reproduces that quite well. The four water case is indeed a 20 K call. For two water case, we get a lot of bond strain in this reaction, so it becomes higher energy. And so reactive F captures that trend pretty well as well. This also goes into combustion reaction. Here's a little biopolymer, for example, that in a single step can be converted into water and formaldehyde with a barrier of just about 70 kcal um, or 65 kcal according to quantum. And so the barrier, this barrier is actually lower than any individual bond strength. And so this is a very important event where in a single step we can create many molecules out of those little biopolymer fragments. So reactive F is, uh, we have a couple of general rules in the development. It's supposed to be a molecular dynamics force field. So it doesn't have significant discontinuities in energies or forces. And uh, the user does not have to predefine reactive sites. So that's very, uh, provided the force field is well developed, all the user does is set initial conditions, build the system, uh, set the temperature and pressure, and then reactive F finds the reactive events. Also, which is very uh, user friendly, it only has one atom type for each element. So carbon is carbon, whether it's in carbon dioxide, in methane or an iron carbide. So the, the react input file really looks like a quantum mechanical input file. You just give, tell this is a carbon atom, you give it the X, Y, Z coordinates and reacts more or less does the rest. It uh, determines connectivity, it calculates charges and all these things. Now this last rule, is very complex for the force field developer because you have to carry a lot of history on your back. You can't just, just change uh, by itself, of course, you may change all the carbon chemistry in a wide range of force fields. So you have to be very careful what force field parameters to change. <laughs> 
So just to reiterate why we do this, React Web is not more accurate than DFT. We can approach DFT accuracy. We, uh, it, we also can approach the DFT transferability, although DFT intrinsically has more transferability than React Web, but it is significantly faster. On the other hand, React Web is quite slow for a force field method. So it is roughly about a factor 50 to 100 slower than a non-reactive force field, or for example, a fast reactive force field like EEM are significantly faster. And that kind of opens the door to something that we're doing right now to sort uh, force field hybrids. So there's an in in interesting space for a reactive force field, non-reactive force field hybrid uh, simulations where we essentially uh, couple the speed of a non-reactive force field with the uh, chemical capability of ReactFF. Now, I won't talk about this too much. So the presentation uh, simulation I'll show today are kind of on the nanosecond level, but we also have a wide range of ability to push the reactive F domain towards a micro microsecond case. And so these are, there are various acceleration tools, uh, like for example, parallel replica dynamics. If you're limited by a single uh, barrier, then these things work very well because you can more or less parallelize your uh, your search path. You can also do this a bit more fancy with temp uh, parallel replica tempering, where you can increase the temperature and swap between various uh, temperature ensembles. So this has been used to turn, for example, uh, cellulose directly into a sort of a keratin structure. Um, also, if you have a, a single chemical reaction, uh, reaction, you can essentially use a bond boost concept where you can weaken a, a series of chemical bonds in a, uh, in a way that you essentially make the reactant and the products less stable and you keep the transition state with its original stability. So you can increase access to the transition state. You can combine Monte Carlo and molecular dynamics that works really well for crystallization. Or if you really know your reaction coordinate very well, you can use a tracking concept where you identify a pre-transition state that's still accessible by normal molecular dynamics and then provide a local boost to lift the system across the transition state. And then overall, we are looking into GPU accelerations. We now get a sort of a more or less a factor of 40 speed up. Uh, if you use ReactiveF on a GPU using the lamps cockles concept. And all of these means that uh, we can get close to microsecond timescales these days and can indeed do ReactiveF at what's, what one could consider non-reactive force field speeds. So one of the attractive features of ReactiveF is its transferability, and that's very much linked to its ability to have our own bond Coulomb interaction and covalence uh, and, and everything that comes in between. So we started with hydrocarbons, but over time we found out that the bond order concept works pretty well for metals. And the fact that we have both a Coulomb interaction and covalence means that we can describe uh, net oxide. We also can describe purely ionic materials like sodium chloride and everything that comes in between. So our ReactiveF uses the same functional form for everything. So it can be easily trans uh, 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 expanded into in uh, to interfaces. Um, so it's available into LAMPs. Uh, my group primarily uses ADF these days. Uh, it provides a very efficient, uh, for at least for a small amount of cores, it's, it's significantly faster than LAMPs. And it's very user-friendly, uh, give you a nice graphical user interface. And also now uh, getting developed into a force field uh, development environment. Um, let me just give you some sort of highlights of past application, give you some sort of idea how the REX projects typically go. So in the combustion domain, um, we train the force field against typically a fairly large amount of DFT data, let's say two, three thousand data points. And this can consist of these type of angle distortion curves. So take a small molecule with DFT, we can easily open up that oxygen carbon oxygen angle that takes just you know half an hour or so. Um, then we can train the force against that. And we have a wide range of angles. We have uh, reaction barriers in the training set. Then we do a validation stage. So we do a relatively small react simulation. This is 40 JP10 molecules. JP10 is a highly strained hydrocarbon used in jet fuels. And we try to compare with experiments here uh, on the, this, this is around 2000 Kelvin is are the reacts numbers. This was done in 2008. Nowadays with our computational capabilities, we can pull this a little bit more towards the right. We can see we can compare the experiment and we see that we're pretty much on the same line. So that validates the REX approach. And we see indeed that the activation energy from REX of F is a pretty good proximity to the experimental uh, data. And then we can scale up. So now we, uh, we can, for example, here we go to about 60,000 atoms and provide a much more complex chemical environment where we have a uh, a chromium 
this is uh, simulating a typical uh, coal-derived fuel where we have some inorganic uh, components in there as well. And we can look at how the catalyst ages in that environment. Uh, we can run this for about 10 to 20 nanoseconds and actually see indeed the position of the pyrite on the chromia surface and all that. So this also works for materials here, for example, one thing that we quite often like to train against are volume energy equations of state. We have your rutile, anatase and brookite for titanium dioxide, where we can train against DFT data. Then we can, in this case, we did a side-by-side -side ab initio molecular dynamics and reactive web molecular dynamics study on a relatively small sample and compare water dissociation rates on a titania surface. And we found out pretty good agreement there, validating the force field. And then once again, we go here to about 250,000 atoms. This is a LAMPS parallel simulation where we look at titania nanoparticle growth in a supercritical water environment, where we find indeed that water dissociation on the titania surfaces leading to a titanium hydroxide plays a key role in their orientation growth. Without the water, these, these particles just hit the cells and stick. With the water, they can, see, can, glide, they can make hydroxide layers, they can slide past each other and find the optimal alignment. <clears throat> a very uh, uh, dominant, uh, application of reactive F is to looking at stress, local stresses and how they impact chemistry. This has a very wide range of applications in, ge in uh, geological areas, but also, for example, in battery environments. <clears throat> so we can train this for, for example, water reactions on silanol areas. We can take a small silanol cluster and look what uh, the barriers for its hydrolysis of water. And then we can apply this on small systems for validation. So we take, for example, here a very small silica nanowire and we can, we can put it in supercritical water and we see that all the hydrolysis reaction happen in the high strain area. Here on the top is the high strain area. This plane here is essentially a low strain uh, area. And we see indeed there's a very strong strain selectivity um, for the hydrolysis reaction. And once proven this, this is about 650,000 atoms. We can use this for more complex environments. This is a clay zeolite interface where we look at all sort of water motion, either from physical uh, water diffusion, which is relatively fast, to chemical diffusion where water dissociates in the clay interlayer, and where the water diffusion essentially slows down to a, to a by a factor of uh, 10 to the power 4 to 10 to the power 5. And we can see indeed that reactive F can describe all these diffusive regimes quite well. Reactive F is quite popular in the high energy community, so these are essentially explosives. Uh, we can train reactive F against DFT data. This is for RDX. We can then compare with small scale simulation for physical response. So we can look at, for example, shock speeds and chemical response, where we can distinguish highly suiting uh, high energy materials like TETB from low suiting materials like RDX. And then this was work by the UC group from Priya Fasista and co-workers. Uh, this, uh, this is about two, three million atom simulation where we have a, a crystal defect and we can see how the crystal defects can serve to initiate a sort of a hotspot, essentially lower the, um, uh, the reliability of the explosive material. So this essentially indeed indicates that if you want to have a very non-sensitive energetic material, which is typically what people want, that you have to make sure that you don't have too many crystal defects because these crystal defects can uh, lead to, uh, uh, to early initiation points. So as mentioned in the previous slide, batteries are a big application domain for reactive F these days. Batteries go through very significant stress strain regimes. Uh, battery anodes can, uh, can have a, almost a 100% volume expansion and contraction during the charge cycle. And that can mean that, uh, so here on the left, here's a, here's a nanotube. Uh, without strain, it's essentially pretty much inert towards lithium. But if you put strain on it, we see can lift, you can etch right through the nanotube. Um, and so this is important. We can then with VXF go towards more realistic anode configurations like this carbon onion. And we can look at physical diffusion at uh, lithium, but we also can look how the lithium can essentially change the carbon configuration during charge cycles. Um, a new area in my group for the last four years are essentially 2D materials. Uh, we have a wide range of force field for calcotinides, so molybdenum disulfide, molybdenum selenates, and similar materials. Um, and we also have been working on maxines with the Kokotsi group at uh, Drexel University uh, and within uh, our uh, first. DOE collaboration. Uh, maxines are titanium carbide or essentially metal carbide that oxidize in the surface. And they're very interesting materials because they're relatively easy to synthesize. And also they're typically good, uh, reasonably good electroconductors. So you can use them for 
application application that main. And then in the 2D space, we can look, for example, at extreme exposure. This is, an, uh, this is a high speed collision of silica. Uh, speed is about 2000 meters a second. Uh, speed that is um, just about accessible by, um, by experiments. <clears throat> and we see indeed that the silica nanoparticle and burst right through the, the graphene. We see here, we have to do a pretty large scale simulation because the shock wave that emanates from the collision, we need to make sure that it doesn't collide with itself. So we need to have a very a, a large graphene base to make sure that we don't get any uh, misinterpretation because of shock wave interaction with uh, shock font interaction. And we see indeed uh, around the, uh, the uh, collision, we have a more or less a random uh, 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 crack, but if you go more to the edges, it begins to proper, propagate ac al along the crystal morphology. So this is an example of how my uh, company can interact with academic projects. So this was a project uh, sponsored by Kansas State University, Ben Lu and, and his co-workers. <clears throat> so hey, they had a good uh, they had uh, Bin Lu is a uh, Liu is a DFT specialist, so we had a fair amount of DFT data on boron nitra uh, BN on nickel surfaces, and they wanted to connect it with experiments. So uh, using their DFT data, my company built a Rex description, and so they managed with that Rex description to essentially simulate the synthesis uh, process of boron nitrides on nickel and nickel chromium surfaces. And so that led to a couple of publications from, from their perspective and essentially new insights on how this boron nitrides grow and then, and then see how the alloy composition can essentially drive your boron nitride formation. <clears throat> And so we can extend this as well. This is essentially regular MD, where we go to about 10 nanoseconds. We can go beyond that. This was work done by Eric Knight's group at the University of Antwerp, where they mixed uh, uh, molecular dynamics with Monte Carlo methods to allow us to actually almost microsecond uh, uh, microsecond and beyond access to, to crystal growth. With regular molecular dynamics, you may be able to go to uh, stage E. But here in stage M, we see a real significant carbon nanotube, including chirality effects and all these, which are very difficult to obtain from straight molecular dynamics. So this is a significant advantage to uh, combine uh, molecular dynamics with Monte Carlo tools or other acceleration tools to access longer time scales. Okay, let me uh, now come to some recent research in my group. Uh, this is work done by Wen Bozhu, a current PhD student. He will graduate in about two months or so, where we looked at chemical looping combustion. Chemical looping combustion is kind of is the idea that we use a metal and a metal oxide to reduce and oxidize fuels. So we can, for example, use a biofuel to oxidize the, uh, the metal, and that can typically be copper. So we can go back a uh, biofuel of copper going to essentially a higher value fuel and copper oxide. And then we can use copper oxide to essentially oxidize a regular fuel. And that's an advantage that we don't have nitrogen in our, uh, in, in our fuel, so we don't have any NOx chemistry, and we can accelerate also the combustion chemistry because of uh, the, 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 the metal oxide interaction. And so we want to investigate this, so we developed a REACT force field for copper service interaction, copper oxide interactions with, with fuels. So we train this against a series of binding energies. Uh, all sort of fragments related to uh, uh, sm uh, with small hydrocarbon species. Uh, typically, uh, we took uh, a syngas conversion uh, ma map for this. Uh, the syngas conversion is a pretty nice sort of feeding ground for uh, small, hydro uh, small hydrocarbon and HCO types of species reactions. And then we trained it against reaction barriers, and overall, we had a pretty reasonable comparison. So one of the important things is to get the barriers in the right spot. Uh, so sometimes we have some uh, differences in reaction uh, in reaction energy, but as long as the sign is correct and the magnitude is in the correct space, we should be able to get pretty good um, reaction distributions out of these. So then we go to a small scale simulation. So in here we picked a simulation for CH3O radicals. We place a number of them on a 100 surface. This is a nice small scale simulation. We run it at 1400 Kelvin, low enough that the copper surface doesn't melt, but that the hydrocarbons have a relatively big fast conversion rate. And then we can compare this to directly experiments and find indeed that <clears throat> all the species that we find, especially uh, um, uh, formaldehyde, methanol, and other types sort of uh, longer term species are in very good agreement with experimental observations. So with that validation in hand, we can now uh, scale things up. We can 
uh, using uh, a, a biofuel uh, simulacrum like a glucose open chain and closed chain. And we find that the structure of the biofuel, the structure in the of the glucose, has a very strong impact on its chemical reactivity. So we find, for example, that the closed chain glucose is far less reactive than the open chain glucose because the, the, the lowest barrier chemical step is when two hydroxyl groups near to each other uh, um, bind to the copper surface and then leave as water, leaving a local double bond. And that reaction is has a much higher barrier for the closed chain case than for the open chain case. And so we actually have, we can do an MD simulation, find out these reactive events, and then figure out indeed how, how this, uh, where the key reaction barriers sit. We can do the same thing with hydrocarbons. So now we do the other part of the, of the fuel spectrum. Now we use a copper oxide and we actually oxidize uh, small hydrocarbons. And we see once again, indeed, interesting kinetic trends. Methane, not surprisingly, is the, is the slowest reacting. We also, but we see, for example, that normal hexane is significantly faster than, uh, than, the, uh, than, iso, uh, uh, than isopentane or especially things like neopentane. So indeed, local hydrocarbon structure has a significant impact on uh, on, on kinetic and with then we can bring that back. So once we find this out, we can do local reaction barrier studies. We can, if ne necessary, go back to DFT and figure and make sure that ReactiveF indeed uh, does the correct kinetics. <clears throat> so we can indeed justify all these things by finding reaction barriers. And then in the end, if we have a full series of reaction barriers, <clears throat> we can scale this up to CFD and uh, do more larger scale simulations. And also, uh, we can then look at how, for example, the morphology of the copper oxide changes. We find that the copper oxide <coughs> is not a uniform nanoparticle during these events. We see indeed that we have a, a, copper, a copper oxide has two oxidation states. It can also become a hydroxide, and we see indeed that this is not uniformly done. The center stays typically at a higher oxidation state because oxygen diffusion is a rel relatively low step. But we also see that the hydroxides like to cluster in a particular area and at elevated temperatures, indeed, the uh, copper oxide begins to fall apart. And we get all these little copper, nano copper oxide nanoclusters that have very different chemistry than the bigger clusters. <clears throat> and so this is something that we can explore relatively straightforwardly with ReactiveF. Now coming to transferability. <clears throat> We developed this force field, and then we got a request from the Max Planck Institute saying, hey, we would like to find a copper graphene uh, description that can that can use to simulate these type of carbon gears. These are clearly not reactive, but they just couldn't find a non-reactive force field that had both copper and graphene in it. So we wanted to use this force field. So we send them the force field, say, well, we're not completely sure where it's going to work, so just give it a go. And indeed, they found out it actually worked quite well. So in the yellow is the copper surface. In the red is a graphitic thing with some polyaromatic hydrocarbon on the edges. And we can indeed see that in the MD simulation, the nano gear works pretty well. There's no chemistry going on here, but we see indeed that these four still transfer pretty well to very different types of the physical environments and also to different chemical environments. This cannot, this is not always, this doesn't always work. Sometimes this sort of transferability requires new force field development, but in, in, in fundamentally, these force field have a, a high amount of intrinsic transferability to them. So let me shift gears now for the last couple of minutes um, and show on a recent expansion of ReactiveF to include some uh, level of explicit electrons. This is called eReactiveF. Um, this was developed, of, uh, so the concept here is that uh, sometimes you need more explicit electrons, especially when you have redox reaction where the oxidation state changes. Uh, or it's indeed when you have when you want to do things like electron beam exposure, exposure, and where the the actual presence of the electrons is a significant uh, is a different aspect. So we wanted to expand ReactiveF following some of the concept of EFF and the Lewis force fields with a limited electronic degree of freedom, keeping the essentially the ReactiveF transferability in place. And so what we do then essentially is you saw, may recall that we had this overcoordination term. We then make this overcoordination term dependent on the presence of electron particles. So the, elect the presence of electron particle changes the number of valence electrons for the, its host atom. So if carbon captures an uh, electron, it essentially it valence it goes down from four to three, because carbon becomes isoelectronic with nitrogen. And then this overcoordination term essentially drives uh, connects back to the chemistry. That means we have essentially a connection point between the bond order parts of the force field and the charge part. And that clearly expands the reaction options. 
this block, oh, I, sorry, I have to switch on my laser pointer percent. Uh, yep, this allows for this type of simulation. Here we have translucent ball is an explicit electron. And so in water, it doesn't do anything. It's inert because water has a sense, it has a negative electron affinity. It doesn't react with electrons. But if we have an OH particle in there, uh, there's an OH radical in the mid now, and we see during the simulation the electron particle gets captured by OH radical and turns into OH minus. So we can really make a transition between a radical state and a negatively charged state. This is pretty fast. This is a 40 second simulation. And indeed, energetically, we see the electron capture moment here in green. We see at about two and a half uh, picoseconds the electron gets captured, and we essentially and, uh, make a stable OH minus uh, radical, uh, oh, sorry, OH minus anion. So recently we expanded this to graphitic materials where we essentially went to almost a sort of a druid model. So every atom uh, here now is, uh, every carbon atom is expressed by a carbon uh, cation electron pair and excess electrons can be described as these type of off-center uh, electrons. And with this, we can describe electron affinity and electron migration barriers pretty well. And so, uh, uh, and so we, we, we hope that we can extend this. So we, we, for example, can now describe that graphene in the in the AB direction is a very good electrical conductor, but in the C direction, it's a good insulator. And so if e we can describe these, and we hope to be able to describe these, uh, extend these things to diamond and silicon diamond type sort of materials. And we also have recently extended this to uh, metals. So this is how we develop this, for example, for iridium metal. We train against traditional reactive things like equation of state for various uh, crystal morphologies, FCC, BCC, simple cubic and diamond. But we also put now in data related to electronic affinity, like things like work functions, and ionization energies. And especially the work function is important there because we hope to be able to distinguish work functions for different services. So we can indeed describe things like plasma interactions with these type of materials. And so this is a simulation that we can do with E-reactive F that we would have no ability for with reactive F. Here we see that every uh, iridium atom is uh, expressed by a cation electron pair. And we can describe, for example, the barrier for electron transfer. And we see indeed that reactive F prefers for the electron uh, vacancy to be at a higher coordinate site. So that's over here. We can move it to a lower coordination site, goes up by about five kcal with a pretty small barrier. So this indeed, this is only a two kcal, three kcal barrier. So at normal temperatures, the electrons will be able to reorganize themselves very, very quickly. And we're now working to extend that to catalysis so we can do proper electrocatalysis with this. Uh, that's at least our aim. Here we see, for example, a thousand Kelvin simulation. This is a nitrogen atom moving from, uh, from a uh, uh, for a one volt side to a sort of an edge side where it's more stable. And we see that the nitrogen holds on to its electron pretty well, but the electrons on the iridium cluster are moving around very extensively. And so we can now, uh, one of the goals in this that we can look at voltage effects. So we can add extra electrons, for example, to the iridium cluster and see how they might affect the surface chemistry. This is still pretty fast. So this is 18 seconds on the laptop that I'm using for this presentation right now. All, one of the advantages, we don't have to calculate charges anymore because char uh, every, the charges are now pretty much uh, represented by Drew type dipoles. So we have uh, we, uh, every, uh, the electrons are minus one charged. Every atom is essentially a plus one charged. And then uh, charge distributions are then expressed by the electron displacing itself from the nuclear site. So, this is a very recent, this is pretty much done three weeks ago uh, by Ben Evangelisti. He's developed this for silver. And these are some unique new simulations we can do. We don't know quite what to do with this, uh, but it's a nice ability that we're kind of looking for applications for. What we see here is our four silver slabs, and we're pretty much putting three electrons from the top. And we see that the initial neutral slabs can absorb a couple of electrons, and then they start leaking electrons to the next slab. And we can, can kind of figure out how much time it takes to saturate each of these slabs. And so we can essentially simulate these type of electron transfer concepts. Uh, this was still a pretty, uh, this takes a couple of, a couple of hours. And we run this on 20 cores with, with ADF, but it's still a pretty accessible type sort of simulation. And as I said, this is just a simulation capability you have developed. And we are looking for where, in which particular areas we can imagine that in electrical engineering, they can be quite relevant. We also feel maybe in, some, in plasma applications, this can be very relevant because we can describe electron absorption, but also the elect 
communities. And so we now kind of less looking for applications of this particular NFT. Okay, that brings me to the end of my presentation. Um, so the main thing is, this is a very transferable tool. It allows us to do simulations of million atoms and beyond. Provide, uh, 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 and uh, we can combine, in principle, all these elements into single descriptions, allowing us to simulate very diverse chemical environments. And then in addition, we now have an extension to e-reactive F that allows us to involve electron transfer and sends you uh, a the reactive F simulation options. Then, thank you all for your attention and thanks for the sponsor, in particular the uh, Bridges Royal Society, who uh, 20 years ago was friendly enough to provide the initial reactive F funding that led to all this work. So thank you, thank you again very much and I look forward to this, uh, hearing your questions. Well, Adri, thank you so much for the insightful and eye-opening um, seminar. I... My, my, my pleasure entirely. I was actually at the uh, uh, you know, the beginning, but but I was assigned as a normal member, so I could add sure. could not actually talk to you. Now I'm promoted to be a panelist, <laughs> so uh, I can talk to you. So it's great to see you here. Thank you so much for for a wonderful. My pleasure. Um, um, Nenia, do you want to um, host this uh, discussion session? Yeah. Um. So yeah, thank you very much. It's a very interesting um, presentation with so many applications. I was trying to get note of those, the ones that I was interested in. And I have ended up with a big, big list. Uh, but we have some questions from the from our attendees. I will be starting with those ones uh, for Professor Adri. So the first one is um, can be can e uh, reacts FF can be used for chemical ionization processes mm -hmm. like uh, yeah, like hydrocarbons plus yep. oxygen uh, in flames or ionization in plasma? Uh, I think so, yes. I think it has at least the mathematical capability to do that simulation. One thing is that the electron in reactive F has a mass of hydrogen, so you have to, its mobility is a bit lower than a real electron. But chemically, I think this is a really good, and this is indeed an application that we're going to be targeting in the near future. So we have already some of the basic CHO functionality in place. We just have to validate it and figure out indeed if, it's, if, if it shows the right concept. But mathematically, I think e reactive F has that capability, yes. Thank you. Um, we have another that, question. Um, is this uh, applicable to hybrid organic inorganic uh, perovskites for simulating the degradation or phase transition phenomena? We actually have a collaboration with the University of Eindhoven. Uh, we just published a paper two months ago, uh, first over Mike Pauls, where we're actually starting to develop these type of capabilities. I think this is indeed a great application for reactive F because especially since you have such a large library of organic species and we have that organic capability in reactive F. So reactive F in, com in computation with data science tools like machine learning and all that can be immensely powerful in that particular organic perovskite domain. And indeed some of the degradation features like for example, water and oxidation based degradation is a very uh, logical application for reactive F. So yeah, that's certainly something that we are working on. And so our fur we have already now, we recently published a uh, cesium lead iodide reactive F extension, and we're currently working to extend that towards organic perovskites. Adrian, I have one question, uh, probably uh, quite a naive. So you classified um, React FS as uh, uh, an empirical MD method. Sure. Uh, how does it differ from the uh, a semi empirical MD? Ah, yeah, yeah. Well, semi-empirical still has a wave function constant. So I would, I would call tight binding, for example, a semi-empirical method because it still, so we actually have, doesn't have a wave function concept. And it means that, for example, mm -hmm. electrical conductivity, apart from what E-reactive F does, it doesn't really have a direct entry in there. So mm -hmm. that's one huge advantage of tight binding DFT. You can still have access to things like band spectra and other types of data that we actually have does not have direct access to. Okay. E-reactive F can describe to some extent a sort of a F, uh, electron density, but we, uh, since the electron mass is fairly high, we actually need to run a relatively long MD simulation to look at electron density, while a, a DFT and tight binding DFT gives you an almost instantaneous electron distribution. So that's, uh, that, that, that's the distinction that I'm making there. Mm 
Sure. So once you have added the uh, electronic uh, reacts FF, does that make it uh, closer to the mm -hmm. semi empirical model? Yeah, it, 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 yeah. Some of the application space, like for example, reacts FF cannot really describe work functions. It just doesn't have uh, the EM right. is somewhat limited okay. capability there. So mm -hmm. these things that used to be exclusively a DFT domain are now getting into the reacts FF domain. But uh, we, 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 it's not that we completely. I mean, still, I wouldn't mm -hmm. use reacts FF for some sure. like, like a green function DFT calculation. Expect to get correct results. So uh, you have to uh, the the e reacts FF electronic capability will always be more limited than tight binding. DFT. DFT or DFT, but we can at least take some of that space and then make that available in sort of a million atom type sort of situation. So that's really what we're targeting there. I see. I see. Um, so the so electronic electronic part is dealt with differently from the wave function, right? Yeah. So um, uh, you also mentioned that the force field uh, uh, should be continuous. Uh, would we expect that for the same elements for for the same matter the uh for a long reactive case the reacts ff would actually you know revert back to the classical force fields yeah that yeah that yeah that's the, yeah that, that that is actually now it requires a little bit of thinking how to do that properly but that's clearly a huge well, application domain because you can if you do it in the right way i mean there's lots of systems where only a small number of atoms are doing the chemistry and the rest of like for example polymer chemistry uh, there might be only one reactor site in the polymer and 99 percent of the polymer may never do any chemistry at all and so if you can switch in an efficient way between reactive f and a non-reactive force field, you directly get a factor 100 in computational speed and so that's uh that, that that's a big price now, it requires a little bit of thinking how you do that, but I think that a reactive non reactive interface is much easier, for example, than a QMM, a QMMM type sort of interface, because reactive intrinsically is much closer mathematically to a non reactive force field. Mm. Probably finally, I, I want to uh, ask about the computation aspects, because you mentioned that, of course, reactive uh, FF should be able to do, let's say, 100 of meaning atoms, right? Yeah. But uh, even for that, I guess the we are still using a small, you know, small portion of the current supercomputing power, right? Yeah, using, yeah, you know, well, tens of uh, uh, let's say cores or loads yep, rather than yep. hun, you know now a, a minimum <laughs> plus a core yep, supercomputer. Yep. What yep. prevented from uh, uh, being used for such big? Uh, nothing really. I mean, the reactive F world record sits about 150 million atoms. It can be done. It's just a matter of resource. I mean, LAMPS has the infrastructure available. And if you go to very large scale simulations, there are other things that come into play. Like if you have so many cores, you have to come up with strategies. If, if one core fails during a simulation, which is almost always going to happen, you have to almost have additional cores that can slot in. So there's a lot of science that needs to be done there. But in principle, mathematically, all the problems are solved. Uh, you just need to get that access. And then and also you need to have a good reason. Now, that, that's one of the problem. A lot of people are just doing large scale simulation because they look cool. But can you actually think of a scientific problem that really needs, let's say, a billion atoms? I'm sure there are some, but that's really where, uh, where, where, where they sit. That's, uh, that's right. I saw a question regarding deep learning potential. That's actually a very interesting question. Um, and that's clearly a competition. And deep learning potentials have very strong connections with where reactive F wants to go. Um, I'd say that deep learning is great. And I think it's going to take over a lot of the reactive F space in the future. Right now, its transferability is not quite where reactive F sits, but it could very well go in that domain. I'm particularly excited about deep learning potentials taking on the middle ground between DFT and reactive F. So you, it's quite feasible to make a deep learning potential that is maybe a thousand times faster than DFT. And that really makes allows us to put lots, make, make much, much larger reactive F trainings. And also deep learning tools are very useful to develop reactive F. And the parameter space in reactive F is hard to develop. And so uh, neural network potentials are extremely good at navigating that parameter space. So there will be a lot of side-by-side -side development of deep learning potential and reactive F. And it will take a couple of years before we really start seeing which particular methods had advantage. I mean, the deep learning potentials are, they can, do, they can be reactive, <clears throat> but they typically, train them against you know, 
almost random DFT data. So they don't sample transition states directly. They can do that, but they don't do that right now. And so I feel that for transition state, for a little while until the college that comes with that uh, goes into that community. But that's a very interesting relationship. And you have to kind of see how this develops over the next five to 10 years. But there's a lot of promise in that particular field. Uh, I would like to rescue one of the questions that was posted, but maybe if sure. to see if you can expand more on the um, on the potential to for the application, how to study CO2 interaction yeah. with calcite surface. Yep. So that uh, we have a force field actually that has been used for that, which you hope to publish at the end of this summer. So that's been a big application and sort of geological applications like uh, silica, calcite services. And we have now four silver calcium carbonate, magnesium carbonate and sodium carbonate. And that really allows you to mix these type of things and really look at, you know, with uh, uh, how these very, uh, especially calcium carbonate and magnesium carbonate are very interesting for carbon dioxide storage. They both have advantages and disadvantages and there can be huge application domain in mixing these various cations and see what gives you the best kinetics. So I think ReXFF will be an excellent tool for this type of work. Thank you. Um, regarding that, so is that ReXFF um, system, does the analysis uh, looking at the evolution towards equilibrium or what is the, the final yeah, state? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. I mean, uh, time scale means that you don't always reach. There are some reactions that are fast enough that even within reactive F time scale they reach equilibrium. But it is indeed something that you always have to ask yourself: Am I at equilibrium or am I just on the path towards it? And so um, this actually is a very interesting connection point, for example, between computational fluid dynamics and reactive F. Sometimes the best you can do a reactive F is get your barriers and sample your chemical space and then get you know, as many barriers out of reactive F to put in a CFD code. And then you need CFD type sort of time scales to really get you towards equilibrium. So, um, and also sometimes you get yourself in sort of an intermediate, you can get to a sort of an intermediate scale that still hasn't right reached equilibrium. So you have fast initial reactions that reach a sort of a pseudo equilibrium and then you have very slow reactions like for example, in catalyst aging or material failure, like so uh, these are important um, that essentially have a very different time scale. So that can be very challenging. And you, need, you typically need multiple methods to really sample that particular uh, thing. But you know, you can, you're not stuck completely with re uh, basic reaction kinetics. Well, once you know the chemistry, you can play games that you can drive reaction barriers down, lose metadynamics, and even sample some of the slower the, the slower chemistry. But then you you need to know at least the nature of that slower chemistry. So what is what would be the limitation in in time? For example, how how yeah. fast has the process needs to be for for you to have the full picture? Well, years? straight molecular dynamics is we can get to uh, practically in a week you can run ten nanoseconds of reactive F. Now, if you have a year, then you can get one hundred nanoseconds, but nobody wants to simulate for a year. At least very few people do. Um, but if you, the, the acceleration tools, which unfortunately the acceleration tools are not uniform, it's not one acceleration tool that works for everything, but provided on the type of chemistry you have, you can almost always find a acceleration tool that can at least get you a factor 10, maybe sometimes a factor 100 beyond that. But that requires a bit more understanding of the chemistry of your system. I mean, something like par parallel tempering is very powerful because it is very universal. And I think it's something that uh, it allows you to essentially increase temperature, increase reaction rate, but in a in a in a thermodynamically uh, relevant way. So you swap between temperature uh, ensembles, and you can really drive your chemistry at a much faster rate. So it, it, these tools exist, but they're not uniform. They're not universal enough for uh, to to be uh, to be applicable everywhere. Thank you very much. It sounds really really interesting. I'm afraid that we have reached the, the end of our webinar. Uh, we have learned very much and I'm sure that uh, the attendees will be able to look at all the papers that are published uh, related to the method. Just uh, say again, thank you, um, Adri, uh, for your time and for a thank great um, presentation. Well, thank you for hosting this and thank you for your excellent questions. And yeah, any questions exist, please feel free to email me. I'll be very, very happy to engage in further discussion.
Thank you, thank you so nice. much for sharing your uh, uh, leading expertise and insights. I, I really learned a lot, enjoyed a lot. I hope everyone has enjoyed. Um, thank you, knowing how much, you know, how busy you are usually. So thank you for your time and efforts. Great. Thank you so much. Thanks. So and I hope the... to see you person in the so far future. Indeed, indeed. Look forward. <laughs> I still we I remember we had a, a good uh, you know meeting in London some time ago, Indeed. but uh, yep. that's uh, yeah. Ho hopefully we'll see each other again uh, in the near yep. future. Thank you so so much um, for your great uh, talk. Thank you everyone. So you, we hope to see you all uh, in the next webinar. We will be happening on the 29th of July. Hope to see mm -hmm. you there. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you all. Bye.